What's up everybody? Hey, Josh here. Thanks for tuning in. In this video, I aim, my goal here is to, is to simplify. And I say that with a smile on my face because this is a very complex, sometimes complicated thing to talk about, but I'm going to try to simplify all the ABCs and acronyms associated with college, more so college financials. Let's go ahead and dive into it. So when it comes to college financial planning, when it comes to college planning, there are tons of acronyms and the acronyms are, are obviously used to simplify, shorten certain phrases or longer titles and also to help us remember uh, what certain things are, right? What certain, certain things may be um, referring to. But in the midst of that, especially as it pertains to college financials, there are tons and tons of acronyms and it can be overwhelming, a little complicated, and it can discourage a lot of us from taking certain actions that could benefit our situation. So um, I'm going to dive into some of the more common acronyms. And one of the reasons I'm doing this, and this is if, you, if you've been following me or, or subscribed to my channel for some time, uh, I've done a video on this a little while ago, but this is going to be somewhat of a review of some of those things, but also some new information in light of recent changes that have taken place uh, within the financial aid space. So uh, if you haven't subscribed and this is your first time here, thank you for watching this video. If you see any value, get any value out of this video, please subscribe or share with someone that can benefit from it. Our goal is to help you save money on what you're gonna be paying for school. Understand your options, opportunities to reduce your out-of-pocket expenses when paying for school. Let's go ahead and get started. One of the more common acronyms that a lot of us are familiar with is going to be something called the FAFSA, Free Application for Federal Student Aid, FAFSA. Now, FAFSA is going to be one of the only, maybe one of the, if not the only, the few acronyms that most people do not uh, use the acronym. They, they kind of take, take an acronym and made a word out of it, right? So it's, it's the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. There's an extra F in there for but it stands for the FAFSA. Now, the free application is exactly what it sounds like. It is a free application. It's pretty much the gateway into financial aid, right? Into financial aid, certain scholarships. It also comes in handy when it comes to applying for private scholarships. A lot of private institutions or organizations that provide scholarships, they wanna make sure the student completed the FAFSA before they provide financial um, financial support or in the form of scholarships. And the FAFSA is a federal application. So when you complete the FAFSA, you are completing an application that is provided to you by the government for federal funds to dictate your ability to pay and afford college. Before we really can dive into the FAFSA, we have to have something called a FSA ID. FSA ID is pretty simple. It's your federal student aid ID. So before you can complete the FAFSA, you're gonna to have to have the FSA ID. There's gonna be one for the student and one for the parent. And you typically only get one. So if you're a parent and you've gone through the college process before, the college financial aid process, you uh, may have had a FSA, FSA ID in the past, that is pretty much gonna be the same FSA ID you're gonna use when completing the FAFSA for your student. Now the FSA ID is basically gonna be your signature when it comes to signing certain documents documents related to financial aid and or student loans. But your FSA ID comes first, completing the FAFSA comes second. So once you complete the FAFSA using your FSA ID, you're gonna get something called a SAI, formerly known as your EFC. What the heck does SAI, SAI, or EFC stands for? Well, SAI is your student aid index, and it was formerly known as your expected family contribution, EFC. Now, there's no longer an EFC that we're using, although they essentially, they essentially yield the same information, but just in a different way. So EFC is what used to be the number where your expected family contribution, you complete the form, the FAFSA, and then now they're telling you, based on your information that you provided, this is how much you are expected to pay. This is how much the government thinks you can afford when it comes to paying for college. Now to simplify the financial aid process, they've done away with EFC and they created a new acronym, SAI, uh, which is your student aid index. And within your student aid index, 
Um, it's basically an index. You get a number very similar to the number you would have received when you had an EFC, but you get this number and that number is uh, interpreted again by the universities to understand or have a, have a better understanding of your ability to pay for school. But that is going to be your SAI. Once you've gotten the FSA ID, you've used that to complete and sign the FAFSA, you get a SAI. Now, let's say, for example, you've made some mistakes on the FAFSA, the financial aid form, uh, when you got your SAI. Let's say you added an extra digit or you didn't understand a specific question and you need to make, you need to make a change. Well, what you're gonna do is try to generate your SAR. SAR is your student aid report, and that is going to kind of share with you the, the inputs, the specific inputs that you may have made and where you may be able to identify a mistake, if there is a mistake, that you might want to address or correct. But your SAR or your SAR is what is generated based on your inputs from completing the FAFSA. Now, in addition to the FAFSA, there's another form out there for certain universities called the CSS Profile for College Scholarship Services Profile. Now, this is typically going to be used at your more selective universities. Not every college, most colleges, in fact, do not use the CSS Profile. There's probably a little over 300 colleges down. That list is growing over the years that require the CSS profile when it comes to financial aid or support. But these are, um, it's gonna be used from colleges that have institutional funds to provide your student when it comes to scholarships or financial aid, in addition to what they may qualify for federally using just the FAST. So if you come across a college that uses the CSS profile, the CSS profile is gonna be secondary to the FAFSA. You start with the FAFSA, and then if required, you also will complete the CSS profile. And what they're gonna be looking at are two different things. There are, there's gonna be some overlap between the FAFSA and the CSS profile, but the CSS profile is designed to go in a little bit more detail and depth as far as your financial situation to have a better understanding of what you might qualify for in the form of institutional financial support. So just as a, just to kind of make sure we're on the same page and as a, as a general understanding, again, as a little bit of a recap, you're gonna start with your FSA ID, then you're gonna use that to complete your FAFSA and or you're gonna also complete the CSS profile if required. That is gonna create a, a SAI, a student aid index. So your student aid index, for example, is gonna be like, let's say $10,000. So once you complete the FAFSA, based on your information, you're gonna, you're gonna get a SAI, it's gonna be $10,000. Each college is gonna interpret that a little bit differently. So now we're gonna go into your cost of attendance, which is also known as COA. COA, or the cost of attendance at a specific university, is going to be different based on your situation. So your cost of attendance at an at in-state college is gonna be different than your cost of attendance at an out-of-state college, right? And your cost of attendance is gonna be different than mine if we live in two different states, but I'm applying to a college in your state, the state that you live in. So cost of attendance is different than tuition. It's not the tuition and fees, it's the overall cost associated with attending that university. Everything that goes into your overall bottom line would be factored into your COA or your cost of attendance. So what happens is <clears throat> a specific university that has a COA, a cost of attendance based on your student situation. So you're coming from you know, California and you're gonna be going to school in Florida and uh, the cost of attendance is gonna be X. They're gonna take that cost of attendance and then use that to subtract, right? They're gonna take your SAI and subtract that from your cost of attendance, your COA, and then that's gonna create a specific need eligibility that your student would have. Cost of attendance for the sake of this conversation, let's say it's gonna be $30,000. That is the cost of attendance. Your SAI for the sake of this conversation is $10,000. So you have a $10,000 SAI, that is gonna be the minimum that the colleges will expect you as a family to pay. Okay, so you take that, that cost of attendance, COA at 30,000, then you subtract the SAI, which is 10,000, 
and that now you have a net gap of $20,000 that your student will be eligible for in the form of need-based aid. And the acronym that is often used for need-based aid is gonna be your NBA. Not the National Basketball Association, but the need-based aid. This is the need-based aid that your student is gonna be eligible for. Now, before you jump to any conclusions as far as your need-based aid, and based on the example that I gave, 30,000 cost of attendance, subtracting the 10,000 SAI, giving you a $20,000 aid eligibility, it does not always mean that's how much the school is gonna give you, okay? Just because your student is eligible for $20,000 in need-based need aid, it does not always mean the college has the ability or the willingness to give your student that $20,000. That is for a whole nother conversation, a whole nother video. Stay tuned for that one because I'll, I'll talk more about the different types of aid and how your, your need could be met at different universities. Now let's talk about what happens after you've applied and the universities have received your information. Now they are accepting your student and they give your student an award package. When you get an award package or your student receives their award package, could be named different things for different institutions, but essentially it's the award offer. This is the merit scholarship they're giving the student. This is maybe the loan opportunities are given the student, the work study, the financial stuff. So when you get your award letter, more so abbreviated, SUB. SUB will stand for subsidized loan. So a subsidized loan is just that. It's a student loan offered directly to your student and it will be subsidized. The interest on that loan is subsidized and those are, those are typically your more favorable student loans that you want to utilize. In addition to a SUB or the subsidized loan, you may also see something that says UNSUB, which would stand for unsubsidized loan. So an unsubsidized loan is a loan just as the name implies. It's not gonna be subsidized. So these are your less favorable loans, but are typically more common. I would say at about 100 students that would apply, 98, 99% of them will uh, qualify for an unsubsidized loan. Now, once you get beyond the loans directly for the student, there's usually a threshold or a limit on how much they will lend the student directly from the university. And any additional amount, so an example that we use, if it's $20,000 of need, then if they give the student, and I'm using an example, $5,000, I know it's more. So if you're watching this video, you don't gotta come at me or attack me in the comments. But for just for the sake of conversation, if there were $5,000 that they provided your student, whether it be subsidized, unsubsidized, or a combination, the difference, the $15,000 left over, and some of the options, the more common options, it, to pay that remaining balance is gonna be by utilizing something called a parent plus loan. So PLUS, P-L-U-S, is a Parent PLUS loan, and that stands for a Parent Loan for Undergraduate Student. A Parent Loan for Undergraduate Student. Now, a PLUS loan uh, typically can be, it's another student loan, but you can borrow, in most situations, if your credit allows, up to the full cost of attendance but that's really depending on your situation, what you feel comfortable with, and that is, again, for a whole nother video. But the acronym that we're talking about here is PLUS, Parent Loan for Undergraduate Student. And lastly, if you decide on moving forward with a specific loan option that is available to your student or to you as a family, you are going to sign something called a MPN, and this is gonna be your Master Promissory Note. Um, and you're gonna sign that master promissory note to uh, initiate or place in force your student's loan. Um, the loan may be directly in your student's name if it's a staff or loan and it's only in a student name, but it may be in just your name if it's a plus loan and it's a parent loan for your undergraduate student. And there's different variations of that plus loan, but in the end, if you decide to move forward with one of those student loans, those federal student loans, you will sign a MPN, your master promissory note. My goal was to simplify this process. If you have to watch this video multiple times, please do, 
please comment below if you have any specific question or if anything that I said um, needs to be corrected. Please, you know, be kind, but let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to update, the, you know, the information that I provided. Um, but for the most part, thank you for watching. I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, if you need any guidance, if you need help understanding some of your options and financial aid and aid eligibility, do not hesitate to reach out to us. You can comment below or you can email us uh, info at a grade above cp.com. If you found this video helpful, please share it with someone else that can benefit from this information and do not hesitate to like this video because it does a lot for me and my channel to get this information out to more people who can benefit from it as well. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for watching and be on the lookout for the next video. We'll talk to you soon.